everybody, and welcome back to the Dallas Arts Organization International Podcast. This is our Dowie Talks Expert Series. Um, we're pleased to welcome today our expert, Nabil Rane. Nabil is a disciple of Chen Yu and teaches in the 12th generation of the founding family of Chen style Taiji Twin. He's a sought after instructor throughout Germany as well as internationally and acts as a super supervising trainer of the Chen style Taiji Twin Network, CTND Berlin. You can find out more about him at www.ctn.academy. Nabil, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. So the first question that I usually ask people is how they got involved in martial arts. Uh, what, what led you to the martial arts in the first place? Um, well, I started as a kid uh, at some point and I grew up in a, in a small central German village. So there wasn't really much much around to be honest so it, it was difficult to do anything but um fortunately my we kind of arranged something with my friends and so on so we, we could drive to a 25 kilometer um um far away like uh, take one dose school and i just actually i think i just liked bruce lee films and stuff i mean he had such a big impact at the time you know so and then of course as a small kid you just like this stuff and uh, I felt really attracted to it um, and um, also my father died uh, at a, when I was at a, still like a pretty young age so and I remember I, I always had this idea that I would somehow get involved in the Asian traditions you know I, I, I don't know where that idea came from it wasn't like um, like uh, I don't know but it, it just was something in my mind I always knew that I would somehow pursue Asian arts, martial arts, maybe even everything related, you know, let's let, maybe let's leave it at that. Yeah. So that's how I got involved. But then for some time, I actually, I kind of stopped. I mean, I kept, kept on practicing myself, but I, I kind of stopped going to any clubs and stuff. And then I, after I had studied in England, I, I met someone there who told me about Taiji and then I, I was just interested. And when I got back to Germany, I wanted to train it, you know. What was it that drew you to Tai Chi? I think, well, he told me at the time that it's like, uh, it's a mixer between meditation and martial arts. So, and I was like a 20 year, 21, two year old bloke. So I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting because the martial arts, I thought, I, yeah, I just liked it. You know, I, I don't even know why, but I think it's just like, I liked it as a, as an idea of personal cultivation and also of like maybe bodily efficiency and stuff. And of course, the meditation, I, I was always fascinated by it, but I thought um, I'd need some vehicle to be drawn towards that. You know, I, I thought maybe like the sitting tradition is, is a bit tough for like a 21 year old to um, pursue rigorously. So at the time, I thought maybe that's a great combination. And so I just got into it. And um, yeah, and, and I loved it. It's And then, I mean, it has both of these aspects and of course, the health aspects also. They, and I think they really form a beautiful balance in a way which um, can keep your interests alive uh, over many decades of training in a way and um, of course in different oh, sorry different uh, times of your life you might have a different focus somehow right but that's perfectly fine I think it's um, if it doesn't become one-sided it, it doesn't matter you know like I think it's quite healthy in a, in a way yeah I agree and I, I think a lot of people that that are drawn to Tai Chi initially um, they, they want that meditation aspect, but like you said, um, they don't want to sit still. You know, I, I heard a joke. It's like an old joke that, you know, Kung Fu is really a way to trick young men into meditating. You know? Hmm. Like, and, so and I, I, actually, I was pretty aware of it. I was, I thought, always thought I was tricking myself into it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, but it worked. And I think it's okay if you trick yourself consciously, it's, it's a car, but it's okay. Sure. Whatever you got to do to <laughs> get the work done. Um, so when you when you returned to Germany, did you did you try to seek out a Tai Chi teacher there? Yes, um, I mean I did not know anything about it. You know, I I think I think I didn't even have internet at the time. So basically, I just came back and I, I told my friends like, oh, I want to do Tai Chi. And then I had a friend, and she said like, oh, my brother's doing Tai Chi, and they do like street fighting once a week um, with street clothes in their club. And I was like, okay. If that's how Taiji is being done, then I'm trying it out, you know. So that was the first school I went to, and um, 
Um, yeah, and I st uh, stuck to it, actually. I, I'm, I'm a very simple-minded person in some ways. You know, I've, if somebody tells me, oh, this is Tai Chi, I basically I just go there and <laughs> think like, oh, okay, this is Tai Chi. And then uh, later, I mean, of course, the internet uh, enabled us all to, to like get more information and so on. And and uh, then I went to to China, and and then all of this kind of stuff happens, you know. So was your first teacher a Chen style teacher? Well, he always he he was like a very eclectic sort of. Um, um, it, I mean, the the branch is still around. Uh, um, also in America, they. Call it uh, Chinese boxing, and um, it's a pretty eclectic style, I'd say, where, where they um, mix different internal martial arts, and um, yeah, and uh, and also at some other arts, and it's very principle based, and it's all, all very practically oriented, I'd say. So that was uh, they kind of have branch in 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 central Germany where I came from. So yeah, that's how I got into it, and I'm thankful. Uh, for Ismet everything school? I learned. Was this Ismet, was this Ismet Himmet's school or no? No, uh -oh. no, 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 no. He I mean he's around. I don't. Oh, okay. I don't know. No, he sometimes he uses that term Chinese boxing as well. That was the reason that I asked. Um. So you uh, okay? No, I'm not sure. I mean, Ismet is my age, I think, right? But we've we've never met personally. I mean, he's in Berlin, but I'm not originally from Berlin. I'm more from Central Germany, like Hanover. It's called so. Oh. But you don't have to know. So. <laughs> so you um what what prompted your move to china why did um were you going there sh strictly to study tai chi yeah i mean uh at some point i i was still pretty young but i didn't feel so healthy anymore and uh, i always thought about myself as a pretty resilient uh a person but uh, at some point i kind of lost that resilience and strength and um, i thought that's not really good at a young age to be so sort of not feeling well anymore and so i really tried to use tai chi at that point um also to to regain my health and and vitality sort of so yeah i think you remember studies or when i finished my studies at university i i went there for a couple of months and then i came back and then i worked a bit and then later i could I could travel more and and stay stay there periods and so on so it was like a process you know so who who was your first teacher in China? Well, my my first teacher in China was Chen Yu. I specifically went there in two thousand seven to study with him. I um, um, I mean, for a long time he wasn't so well known. So, um, and then I I, I had known him for a couple of years, but um, like of him, uh, not in personally. But and I always wanted to go there, but at that time I couldn't really travel so much. I had work to do, so. Um, but then in 2007, I, I went there for the first time and I, I was like su super blown away, you know. And I also discovered at that point I was um, starting to polish my my Chinese again, which I had um, I had started a couple of years earlier. But I, well, I, I'm not, a, I didn't really continue it well all the time. So, um, and then I started to see, you know, like in these arts, um, because I think they are really arts. You know, they're not uh, science. And I think that's all actually a very important distinction between because, of course, when we are scientifically trained and in the West, especially, we always want to be like specific in a way which is uh, good for science. But in arts, um, I think arts work on, on it like differently. And it's really we have to understand that these are arts and quite often they are very personal practices also. I mean, there's a lineage and a tradition and a collection of methods, but there's also at some point always a certain personality which is coming into all everything and changing the methods. And it's also necessary to pass them on. Like if they, you have to make your uh, the methods yours, right? So right. otherwise you cannot embody them and, and teach them on. And I think that's a very important process. And um, so I started to understand that all the Chinese terms and the way they're being embodied and they're being being explained and shown it's very specific and um my understanding before that was i think very mediocre i would say i thought i was very clever and knew everything but um i i didn't just <laughs> being very honest i i just didn't know uh, too much because this um this connection between like theory and a truly embodied practice was 
the missing link, you know. And then if you have Ch someone like Chen Yu is practicing one of these folk arts, his family art, yeah. um, to just at such a high level, then um, you get that link, sort of, you know. And that's also where I think nowadays, I mean, I was interested at that point, I was interested mainly in Chen style. But nowadays, I think it's even, it doesn't really matter at, at all anymore what kind of style, because it's more like if you practice an art, you, if somebody shows you an art and you practice that art to such a high level, it does not really matter what kind of art it is, you know, like, right. uh, I, I see met, like more similarities with uh, some arts which are not really related to Chen style um, when the teachers have achieved something, you know, yeah. so then there are cer certain similarities which I find very interesting. Yeah. I think you bring up a great point about it, it being an art and, and the, the personality coming through in the art, because when we talk about, you know, regardless of what style it is, but we'll just say Chen style Tai Chi, you know, there are different branches of Chen style Tai Chi, different people practice it in different ways. Um, um, could you maybe explain to our audience a little bit now? Now, Chen Yu is the grandson of Chen Faka, correct? Mm -hmm. Could you maybe talk a little bit about that, like uh, from uh Chen Faka to his son to Chen Yu, like how that art developed along those lines. As far as like um, Chen Faka, I think had a reputation for being a pretty open style teacher for especially for that time period, you know. And he he made some uh, like contributions to the art, you know, not just in terms of spreading it, but maybe innovations. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, that branch or that that branch of the family style? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, Chen, Chen style, um, just short historical, uh, like, uh, um, essay or a, line, know, a resume is, uh, of course, it, uh, Chen village, uh, was founded. And then we basically say there, there was a, a founder, Chen Wang Ting, who, who like founded the, the boxing, um, frames or like he, he basically, uh, invented Tai Chi Chuan. Now there's, of course, uh, these things are oral traditions nobody history is, is nobody wrote it down or like i mean people found some written things about him but of course there's nothing about uh his art and if he developed it and where he got his inspirations from if it was from an older family tradition or uh, these things you know but in the oral traditions chen wang ting he he founded it and then it was uh taught in the village and then of, um at some point um of course also different frames came about and um, so what we call the small frame and the large frame are the ba two basic frames in, uh, from Chen village. And most of the small frame people actually went away th through the cultural revolution and, and the civil war and so on. Um, and so they're not, they went to Xi'an mostly, but I mean, they've also spread uh, just like the other ones, of course. Right. And from the, but there's also some controversy if people really distinguished these to frames too much, or if it was also more like a personal development thing. And then at some point, much later, people started to distinguish them much more just uh, when they had more like an external need to do that because outsiders came and wanted to know more. You know, maybe they didn't really distinguish it much, you know. Right. So, um, and then Chen Chang Xing, of course, he became very famous because Yang Lu Chan, who made Chai Ji Chuan famous outside uh, Chen Jiago, uh, he was his, uh, uh, he studied from him. And he said so, you know. Um, and then, of course, his Wu Yuxiang, who studied with Yang Luchan, also learned, tried to learn from Chen Changxing, blah, blah, blah. So, sorry, I don't know how long I should make this history. No, uh, please history. continue. Um, so, Chen Changxing was the uh, ancestor of Chen Fake, you know, Chen uh, Gengyun, Yenxi, Fake. And then, so that was also one line. And um, so, Chen Tfako was teaching also in Chen Jiago, many people, and many people say he was like a, a really like a standard bearer, you know, also like Chen Li Ching, for example, who was a very famous um, female practitioner from the small frame. She also said like uh, Chen Tfako had the highest skill and was very, very good. And uh, she also knew a bit of his frame. So, and then he, at some point he went to Beijing because Chen Zhao Pi had kind of invited him because Chen Zhao Pi was there before him and he was invited to Shanghai. 
So and then he said, okay, my my uh, my uncle and my teacher basically also can come to uh, to Beijing. So and then Chen Fakke, he had a couple of children. His I think his oldest son died. Then he had one daughter. Um, and his youngest son was Chen Zhaokui. Yeah. And his older son went back to Chen Zhago quite early because I think he had to um, take care of the land and, uh, and everything. Uh, and, but he was also much older. And Chen Zhaokui uh, and Chen Yuxia, uh, the daughter, they grew up in Beijing with Chen Fakke. And Chen Fakke just became very famous. I mean, I think he was a very, in a way, he was very outspoken. Um, and um, he just made a rep big reputation for himself. And Chen Zhao Kui, um, I think he taught he was taught a lot like at home. So and he was very clever. But after middle school, I think he couldn't couldn't uh, continue to go to school because uh, I mean in in traditional societies, uh, you know, not everybody can go to high school and and, right. and universities. I mean, it was probably I mean it was definitely the same in. In Europe and I guess in, in the US too. I mean, not everybody could afford everything. So, but he was very scientifically interested. So Chen Zhao Kui, he read a lot of books and anatomical things and so on. So he's really like another bridge between the tradition and uh, and the modern age in a way. Uh, but he had to travel a lot because of the political situation back then. You know, the Chen family was not regarded so well by the communists because they they were landowners, and also of course. Uh, they adhered to old traditions, you know, which were a bit frowned upon uh, at some points. Later, it was uh, encouraged again. But um, during the time, Chen Yu always recalls, like, uh, you could be killed when you had to go outside your house, you know, when you... And um, he means it in a very literal way. You, you just, you had to be very, very careful at those times. And um, because civil order was at some point, point breaking down and um of course we we know this in all countries when that happens uh, that things get get dangerous you know so um so and Chen Zhao Kui yeah he was very um, so he was in a way very interested in education also so he wrote manuscripts books um but nothing was published everything most of the stuff was published um either after his death like my my teacher published a couple of manuscripts uh, very interesting to read um he wrote together with a, another student from chen Fake. and of course some people like ma hong and uh, Zhang mao jen they also preserved his teachings because they wrote down their teaching then and you can after you've read a lot of his stuff you can really uh, you can have a feeling what is the gist of his teachings, you know, what the way he taught. Um, yeah, and it's, it's very interesting. And then Chen Yu was, of course, he was uh, studying with his father and basically accompanying him all the time. And uh, I think it's a very beautiful frame. Um, you also said, um, sorry, your, your question was very large. Please uh, just interrupt oh, me. Please. If... <laughs> um, uh, it's very, edu very educational. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Um, you, you also said like um, there were some innovations Chen Fake uh, did to the style. And of course, that's also a bit of a matter of controversy. Um, in our lineage, we basically say that Chen Fake um, told Chen Zhao Kui um, that it's the traditional method and just it had not been taught like that outside the family before. So this is also what Chen Zhao Kui basically so Chen Yu, and um, so that's our version. And um, of course, on the other hand, there will always be changes. You know, if, I think if because that basically when you learn an art, I think that like two general, simple like very in a very simplistic sort of way, two stages of learning. One is where you just imitate because right. you learn the method, basic methodology, and then one stage is where you embody and you make the practice yours, and it becomes more individual again. Right. So like it's like playing a piano, you know. You, yeah. you can't be very individual in the beginning because yeah, it's not nice. But you have to learn the scales and so on, and then at some point you can change it. So Tai Chi Chuan, or most of these arts, I think, are the same, and um, so they have to change at some point. Right. And it doesn't mean you change everything, but you make it yours. And so, for example, if you look at Chen Zhao Kui's students, even those many of them didn't really study too long with him. 
but they still developed a very good skill. And if you watch them, you can see what was his basic method. When right. you're like educated that way, you can basically see, oh, okay, this is um, what he was teaching. And um, I think that's very beautiful, you know, like you're not imitating someone like endlessly, but uh, this methodology really enables you to to become empowered and and yeah, yeah. that's what all, I, I was always like so much appreciating from my teacher. Like when Chen Yu was teaching something, he was really, really telling you how to do it and empowering you and not just like, you know, giving you something, some correction, which you, you you will never be able to 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 continue. You know, like he really teaches the practice, and then you have it, and you can pass it on. So I think that's a very beautiful way to 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 continue these traditional arts. Also, what is a different difficult um, endeavor endeavor in our times? You know. Yeah. So I I read that you you know basically when you when you met him you kind of knew right away that this was the person that you wanted to study with when you saw him when you saw him practice um, was there something specific about his practice was it the high level of his practice or was it the fact that his practice is a very it's a very martial practice right it's a very um, it's it's a, it's very evident that it's a martial art right yeah, yeah was that what attracted you to it. You know, sometimes you have these things, uh, these weird things in life. Um, and usually, I'm not the person to say it on the podcast. Because, <laughs> <laughs> but now here I am. Yeah. So, you know, like this, the thing when I was like 13, I was telling my mother, oh, I, at some point I will go into Asian arts. And yeah, it's this. like a I, I didn't know why, but like it was fake. like, yeah. it, it feels very, term. yeah, it was yeah. Feels very, very yeah. fatalistic. It was the same when I when I saw a picture of it was just a picture of Chen Yu, and I knew right away I would I will study with him. Yeah, and um, and I didn't really understand, you know, all the things about uh, the traditions and the folk traditions. I didn't really understand them well at the time. I I was culturally too detached from that, um, but so basically when I went there, I was also like, okay, I can just learn Chen style, you know, it can learn Chen style there, 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 and then maybe I can combine it or whatever. But nowadays I have a completely different perspective on these things, you know, I, it, because I think it's much more personal. It's not yeah. about one style, but it's, and I mean this respectfully, but it's more like you follow someone if you want to really learn the details. Right. And uh, also, and then you start to see, okay, the practice can be very, very different, you know? And um, yeah, I, I knew right away. And then of course, learning in China is always, it's, it's also funny and uh, very interesting. You learn a lot, you know, the cultural learning is great. And um, yeah, but it, when you touch Chen, like I, I remember he was like, just uh, slapping me on the back when, you know, you you fall, <laughs> you fall over the bed and uh, it, um, so I was so lucky. I, I just hang out with him basically, and he was teaching me stuff. And um, but at the time, yeah, I didn't really understand it well, but I knew that I would continue it. Yeah. So you'd written that um, when you first practiced with him. Maybe it was when you first practiced with him that it was snowing when you were there, so that he'd come to your hotel every day for like you know a couple of weeks to practice with you. Uh, what was that like? Was he just kind of bouncing you off the walls of the hotel room, or uh, what? What sort of things did you work on? Like? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, there's always this uh, guanxi aspect, you know, this relational aspect. So, um, I mean, he was very kind. I later, yeah, I I couldn't really understand it and uh, appreciate it uh, as much at, at the time. But like, yeah, it was snowing. So I called him and like, oh, can you come to the hotel? And uh, my Chinese was crap, you know, I mean, yeah. and... <laughs> Um, but that's also how he learned. And then he went to my hotel room and smoked and had tea, you know. And we basically we just in the beginning we just talked. Yeah. You know, I was like, and then he would. He, I mean, he didn't know me. He was he, there was a guy coming from Germany and right. wanted to study with him. And it's a bit like, you know, it's like if somebody comes to you and ah, I want to study with you, Bill. And yo, show me this and this, and you're like, okay, wait a sec, you know. Right. You want to know, 
And so he, he was kind of watching me in it and he said, yeah, you, you practice a bit. And then he, he looked at my practice and was smiling, you know, and I was always changing to and fro because I was like, I had learned the 74 or five frame, the, mm -hmm. what they call the, the old frame. Um, and I had learned what they call the new frame, which of course is said to, uh, that it was developed by Chen Farke. So I was always uh, going from one to the other because I was like, oh no, I maybe because he's a grandson, but then no. And uh, he, but he was laughing at me. He was like, oh no, you're, you're doing the 75. Now you're doing the 83. What are you doing? And then he's, yeah. And then that's how things start, you know? And then at some point he says like, oh, that's wrong. You know, I mean, he could have start, started right from the beginning to say that's all bo bollocks. But um, he, then he said, yeah, okay, you, you, you can do it like this. And then he's, and then, of course, he teaches you the fundamental methods, you know, like the standing. Then immediately, Chen Yu is always teaching applications for everything. And just this, this uh, feeling how connected he is, you know, in all these applications and stuff is, of course, um, incredible. And then you have this, this goal, what you want to practice towards, you know. Yeah. So what, was a, what would you say would be like a standard... Uh, day of training with him what was it like what things did he work on with you i think there was no standard day no standard <laughs> what, I, sometimes, sometimes a lesson plan is a bad idea you kind of yeah. what's going on in the studio <laughs> yeah it's um well in the beginning he would always be i mean of course the foundational methods and then of course you basically i had to learn with the form new again so basically that's of course giving the whole um learning uh, a very good structure you know the 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 methodology is basically in, in ingrained in, or already inside the the uh, the form practice so when you start learning the form and then you start learn, putting in all the uh, the the methods kind of you know and then can you just like you know, he tells you, oh, this is bad. It has no practical use, you know. He, then he shows you why it, it's, it has no practical use. And then uh, he wants to see, of course, if you practice it. And if you don't practice it, then you, right. you want to do much more because it's like silly, you know, why you can teach someone, you can't teach someone who doesn't practice the stuff you tell them. So, um, and then if you practice, then he will tell you the next thing, you know, sort of. But it can be very intense, yeah, hanging out and because the stances and everything is uh, it's very intense. So in the beginning, basically you can't do it because your body needs to become accustomed to this sort of um, yeah, the standing, you know. I think because Tai Chi Chuan, I think it's uh, such an integrated method in, in a way. I always say it's like holistic and integrated because holistic, I mean, there's never everything which is all encom encompassing but uh, it has so many different aspects like mental uh, phys like physical of course muscles uh, ligaments bones neurology you know perception and you have methods which train all these different sort of parts in a way right so like you have structural aspects you have like energetic aspects you have breathing aspects you have mental aspects and you know, hearing, everything is like so connected. And um, so I think when the body changes because of the practice, it's always like, if you take a certain body structure, for example, and you don't have the muscles, of course, you, you can't hold it. But then if you have the muscles, you can, again, correct the body structure so that the muscles burn again and so you don't have the muscles you know right. and then sometimes of course it's not only the muscles but you have to elongate the ligaments because otherwise you're just becoming too tight so and all these aspects are so um yeah so interesting but also your your time uh, your body just needs time to adapt you know you mentioned earlier that you know you were not feeling so well uh, at, at a certain point and you wanted to like improve your health, did you find that your health improved uh, fairly rapidly as a result of uh, your training with Chen Yu? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, even though I was training in smoky Beijing mostly, um, <laughs> you know, um, because I mean, at the time, now it's better, but I, at the time, I remember when I went there with students, like some of the students uh, after 
like three days they had like if they blew their nose it was all black yeah. you know so but you know i mean all the because chen yu's method is so he's really so clever um in the way he builds this method because it's very efficient and of course it, it should be martially efficient but that means that your body is moving in an efficient way right? right so if you're of course putting wrong pressure wrong you're loading your body in a wrong way you're holding your joints in a wrong way this is martially not not useful but it's also not useful for your health right, right? because like so i think sometimes people think it's like martial versus health but i think that's not very yin yangy right it's like you have to it's basically it's the same and only then tai chi grows, you know, if you make, oh, now I practice a bit for health, now I practice for martial, and you don't connect it, I think it's, uh, that's not, it doesn't lead to too many good um, uh, yeah, results. So, and my, yeah, my health improved uh, quite nicely, yeah. That, that's a good point. I, I, I've noticed, you know, a lot of times people, they have set up like what you said, sort of like a false dichotomy between the health and the martial, but it's like, you know, if something you're practicing something that you think is martially effective but then by the time you're 50 years old your knees are blown out that's not very effective like you haven't even been in a fight and you've already destroyed yourself you know um so it can't be can't be biomechanically correct if it's not biomechanically correct it's probably not martially effective yeah and, but, definitely. and i mean it tends to of course i mean knee problems uh you, you, people have just have to take care of their knees i mean otherwise they can't practice a long time and um there's and yeah but um yeah i mean the bone structure is important and then what you develop from it but without the bone structure everything else you develop will always have like a negative effect on your body i think it's not very good i mean it's, at some point of course i mean if you if you do a lot of partner work and you that that is of course a part which can be like a bit additional in the, way, in the sense like how much practical work you want to put into into that and um, of course, if you're getting punched or something, it might not be healthy. Um, but I mean, that's like a different aspect, I think, to it. Right. But in the form and the body movement and the body work and everything, that should be efficient in the sense that it will uh, benefit your martial abilities and your your health. Yeah. You know. Did he emphasize post standing much at all in your training? Um, standing meditation. No, no, he he didn't. I mean, he did teach me standing uh, pose, you know, uh, standing pose, a couple of different versions. Um, but it's also because, I mean, the stance, no, um, you know, you call it like a near jiazi in, in Chinese, uh, the mm -hmm. molding frame. So, and that's, so you basically you can make a, make a post out of, from every posture right. in the form. So, that is more common so it wouldn't be fair to say he he wasn't like standing at all because he could he would quite often let us stand in the form and or, or even if you would like practice the form very very slowly it is like a long long standing right. post you know uh, but that's a bit more common and i think it's also nowadays i think it's more more healthy you know i had a time when i stood like uh, an hour every day yeah. but i at that time, I was not studying with him, uh, and I, I'm not sure about its health effects, you know, because it can also be done wrong, and then yeah. um, it makes people very, um, un, like, it takes a lot of the dynamics away from them, and I think slow form practice is much better because it, it has all the benefits, but it doesn't have the ne negative side effects. Yeah, you know? that sounds right. I, th I think that's one of those things where, where if you do it, sometimes less is more, you know, people, uh, they stand for five minutes and it's an achievement to them. So they want to stand for 20 or 30 or 40 might not be that great of an idea. You know, the body becomes tired and you start to overcompensate with muscles and other things like that without even realizing you're doing it. Yeah. It makes sense that to practice the form slowly like that. So I, yeah. it's also how I teach it. I teach like the standing more in a, in a like a qigong system so it can become very intense you know but also i, let, I try to let people ha have some time to develop their bodies and not just put them into the, the bitter eating too much because it can go both ways right like so they ha have to eat a bit bitter but it, then they, it also they need to relax a bit and have their bodies adapt and i was talking to byron jacobs in beijing um and um 
I think that was a very similar thing he said, like in the in the Xingyi Quan, the Santi posture, he said like it, it's not about um, how long you stand, but how you stand, you know. Right. And um, I think that's basically the same, like uh, the same idea. Yeah, it's a quality and quantity thing. Yeah. So after that um, original trip, did you did you move to China or were you traveling back and forth between Germany and China? No, I was uh, I was going there the, um, again the same year, and then I basically I kind of moved to to Australia and China. So. Uh, and um, because my my wife was doing her PhD in uh, Australia, and I was um, kind of accompanying her along, and uh, but I was basically spending half the time in, in Beijing also. I, I and then afterwards, I then I came when we came back to Germany again. I, of course, I traveled there again quite often. But at some point, also that's what I mean. Like at some point, I also knew I had learned the method, you know. Um, but I mean this in the in the most respectful way. It's like sometimes people think like, oh, you know, um, he might think he's he's a great guy. That's not what I'm I'm, I'm trying trying to say at, at all. But I think it's like if you if you learn from a teacher and you practice a lot and you spend a lot of time with your teacher and then at some point you say you've learned the method, it's actually a sign of respect. Yeah, you know, sure. if you if you learn from a teacher for ten years and you still say and you train a lot and you're saying, but I'm still, I don't know nothing and I'm my I, I'm my practice is shit. Something's so, wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not not very respectful for your teacher, you know. Yeah. Like, okay, basically, you're saying he, he hasn't taught you anything. Right. Uh, and uh, so, <laughs> when you've learned the method, I mean it very respectfully because now I can also teach uh, my students well you know and, and that is very important to keep a lineage alive you know absolutely uh, so during this time period when you were living in australia were you uh, and traveling to beijing were you teaching as well at that time or did that come later yeah well, i was actually already teaching a bit of chen style from another tradition before i went to beijing oh, okay. and uh, then i started to teach chen yu taiji the first time in australia so I had a, just a couple of students because I was not there uh, all the time, but I had a bunch of students and um, and it was really good for me because um, when you're teaching, you're also repeating everything for yourself, you know, and you're like thinking everything through and and you're showing applications and they have to, you know, you have to make them work and so on. So and if you're like... Um, it's, I think it's a very good uh, way to research your own art in a way. Oh, I agree. It's one of the best ways to learn is to teach. Find, <laughs> yes. out, find out what you really know, I think. So uh, at what point did you start your current organization? Well, I, I went back to Germany and then I... Uh, oh, no, I was st still in Beijing and uh, I... Learned, I studied a lot together with a with a good uh, friend and and a kung fu brother of mine, and um, he's also from Germany. And then we basically we just we sat uh, down with a drink and uh, said like, should we do something together or should we have like build up separate schools? And then we were like, ah, let's do it together, you know. And then he was like in southern Germany. I was moving to Berlin when I came back and. Um, so and then we started having a camp once a year where our students got together and we just we the vibes were really good you know so yeah. we thought okay this will it's the the sum is more than its parts sort of you know and that's how we started and then we had to give it a name and uh, we discussed it with Chen Yu and yeah that's how it got started in a way yeah is um is, is would you say that Chen style is the most popular style of Tai Chi in Germany N no I Yang style Maybe I think it's still young style. Yeah. I mean, the, the numbers I heard, but they might be a bit uh, outdated. I, I I'm not researching it like every day, uh, but I think uh, because of the history, of course, in, uh, of Tai Chi Chuan in the West, it's um, may, it might even be a uh, Jiang Man Ting style. You know, the young yeah. style from that tradition because it was the first. Which called, I think Germany was also. Um, I think it because. I think the first Taiji came from the US, I would think, yeah, but I'm not 100% sure. But of course, there was always a big 
big um, impact the US culture had on in Germany. And China was at that point still cut off. So I think um, many Christian traditions actually came over from the US. And so I think young style is still the, the main style. Yeah, that's why I ask is because young style, I think, is still the most popular style in the United States also. But Chen style in the last 20 years has really started to grow in popularity. Um, more people recognize it. Um, so I was curious. So I think also a bit more. Sorry, I think it's also a bit uh, the organization is a bit different. I think so. So sometimes maybe the Chen style organizations are a bit bigger than the young style not every each and every one but just right. like i think that's how we see it but i think um youngsters are so widespread that uh, people in small groups are practicing all over the place and i think the numbers are still different but uh, I, I i can understand why why you think like that and i sometimes I, i'm the same you're like well this looks like it's a big organization you yeah that, that's probably correct there's a lot of sort of like you know what we call mom and pop schools you know small schools family schools that teach young style tai chi Hmm. So when you started your own organization, you took some of your students uh, to China uh, to, to train with Chen Yu directly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did that for a couple of years. What was that like? Uh, it was great because um, I think that's also like a, like a good way to keep these traditions alive and you show your students, your teacher and vice versa. And uh, we asked him, oh, do you think we are teaching them correctly? And uh, so, yeah, it was really, really great to have that also that social aspect, you know, and my students loved it. They got to understand the culture in a way which basically, you, if you do a China trip, you, you will never hang out with Kung Fu family, you know, and uh, training every day for, I don't know, six, seven hours. And so I think it was a great experience for everyone. Yeah. And then we started to teach, of course, also in China, you know, our students, but also at seminars, we started to assist Chen Yu. So there's also quite an honor in a way because, um, but then it's also, yeah, you start to understand that's how living systems work. You know, like a teacher teaches someone, he has a student, and then at some point he empowers the student to, to teach. And at that point he can supervise and the student feels okay, I have to really train and, and do this well because, and then they can pass it on. I think it's it's a very natural and organic way to to learn and teach tidy trends. So um, we kind of need to preserve this kind of teaching. Um, and sometimes in the West, of course, we are like very certificate based and stuff, but we should always remember that this is where it comes from and to keep this living system alive in a way. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, you know, it's it's important to have a, a lineage, but at the same time, uh, just because someone is is trained in a lineage doesn't mean that they're they're that thing. That, that doesn't mean that they're a representative of that lineage necessarily. You know, no, it's lineage is everything and nothing. You know, it's the, I, <laughs> it's I, the same like you know the bifur ceremony. Like yeah. if you become a formal student of someone, it can mean nothing, right? And it can mean everything. It it's um, but <laughs> personally, it can mean everything to you, right? But, in terms of your skills, it doesn't mean anything. You know, right. you're not being transformed in one night from a nothing to a something. <laughs> but uh, so it's both. You know, you have to see what uh, what it means and what it what it doesn't mean. You know. So we talked a little bit earlier about you know how every individual has to bring their own personality to the art. Um, if what would you say that you, you that you've brought to the Tai Chi that you teach, or what would you like to bring to the Tai Chi that you teach? What 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 from your personality do you think that you've infused into your Tai Chi Chuan? Mm, I think I've, um, in a way, I'm another bridge. I would say I, I'm another bridge from um, this time or from from China to to the West, and um, I think that's what I can maybe bring gift to the Taiji, you know, like to preserve the 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 art in its in an intact, hopefully intact sort of way. You know, so I'm really interested in, in the Chinese uh, theory, in the Chinese wordings, in the Chinese um, you know, the the good jewel, like the, the 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 secret formulas, how people spoke in olden times about a certain certain methods and methodologies so i'm really interested into the, into that and um into the linguistic and cultural aspects so but I, of course i feel the need to translate this into the 
Western culture. And so, for example, I build a curriculum and not to like cut away things from the art, but because the first kind of a couple of years, I taught uh, some things to my students, of course, but I felt like they don't have a reference frame. They don't know how to, where to put all the things I'm teaching them. So I thought, okay, I have to give them something like a curriculum, like a frame framework. So, and then they can use this framework to put all the knowledge into it and, and take it away. And I think that's a bit like my, uh, the, something I can bring into the art, you know? And then of course I, again, some of my students are physiotherapists or osteopaths or doctors or uh, whatever. And so these people then can be another bridge, you know? So, yeah. because then they can take my traditional knowledge and also translate it again into their fields of expertise. And um, so I'm trying to shape this in a, in a functional and, and positive way, you know? Yeah. So that kind of ties nicely into my next question. Um, you know, we, I, I feel like we're going, we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence in traditional Chinese martial arts there for a while. There's things sort of like shifted completely to like sport based martial arts, like Muay Thai or mixed martial arts and things like that. But those sorts of things are not necessarily for anyone, everyone, you know, and I, I think there's, to me, it seems like there's an upswing in interest in traditional martial arts. What do you, what do you think the future of traditional martial arts, particularly maybe Chen Tai Chi, what, what do you see for the future? Another <laughs> question. It's, um, I mean, I'm really glad you say that there might be a resurgence because I, I actually thought it's uh, actually the contrary. I thought it's uh, nowadays everybody uh, really looks down on the traditional martial arts. Um, but I hope you are right. Um, and, um, but maybe it's also a time where all these things happen at the same time. You know, some people look down, some people love it. Some, So I think maybe it's also, we are living in a very heterogeneous uh, sort of time. Um, so I'd hope that the traditional arts uh, stay intact and um, also preserve what should be preserved and not preserve an image um, mm -hmm. which has actually no actual meaning anymore. You know, that, that would be my, my hope to preserve the methods and everything which is really uh, worth preserving and um, also connects us to, a, to an ancient time in a way, like um, the roots of humanity, you could say, you know, like our consciousness, body feeling, how all these things developed in a way and um, and how we can really reconnect with our own past with these arts. And um, that would be nice. You know, I, I love all the methodologies and the, the cleverness the, and also the the empiristic sort of thinking. Like over the in generations, they, they tried out many things and some things worked and some things didn't work. And it's a different kind of empirical thinking than our science-based system nowadays, but it's still like an empirical system and um, to keep that, to preserve that, you know. Yeah, that's a great answer. So Nabil, uh, thank you for talking to me today. Um, would you like to tell people where they can find you? Um, yeah, if you, there are not too many people with my name. So if you Google it, uh, or you can uh, just put in uh, www.ctn.academy, which is my my online program and some info for, and there's some workshops I'm going to travel and so on. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for you. taking the time to, to talk to me. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. <laughs>